All right, Hotep, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is it is um, Tuesday, August 30th, 2022, and we are live. Uh, so I want to um, come on and deal with this topic here, dealing with 1619. In August 20th, 1619, because um, August 20th, 2022 was the 403rd year anniversary of August uh, 20th, 1619, when 20 and odd Africans um, were brought into Point Comfort in Virginia. And they were on the White Lion pirate ship. And this is. Uh, this in, in history marks the uh, first presence of Africans who were captives in what would become the 13 British colonies, which would later become the United States of America. So I was going to talk about this on our Sunday show, uh, the African History Network show, uh, our Sunday, August 28th show, but we had so much information and we were dealing with uh, uh, the uh, Joe Biden student loan forgiveness uh, program. We were dealing with that a lot. And I did not get a chance to talk about this uh, commemoration and this history, this 400th year, uh, 403rd year commemoration and this history. Uh, so we're going to talk about that uh, on today's show. Also, I'm going to let you know about our new eight week online history classes starting up in the month of September. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have class number one uh, starting up on Thursday, um, September 8th. It'll be 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then we have on Tuesday, September 13th, we have from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So we have information about that at our website, the African History Network.com, the African History Network.com. So we'll give you some information about that on today's show, also, and uh, talk about some of the information in the class. Uh, this here dealing with 1619, we deal with this in the class as well. Okay, now, unfortunately, most of what we know about August 20th, 1619 is false. Most about most of what we know about August 20th, 1619 is false. So we're going to dispel some of those myths as well. OK. And when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, it's also important to understand that African people were in the land that we call the United States of America and in the Americas for tens of thousands of years. So, um, we know, we come to this land at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan. They're the ancestors of the Ainu and the Twa. You know, this was our land stolen from us. We were here before. Uh, even in the land we call the United States of America, we were here even before Native Americans came into existence. OK, we'll talk some about that as well. All right. So um, there's a good article from History.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel, and it deals with uh, first enslaved. Let's see. Let's go right here. Uh, August 20th, 1619. First enslaved Africans arrive in Jamestown setting the stage for slavery in North America. First enslaved Africans arrive in Jamestown, setting the stage for slavery in North America. Okay, now also it's important to note that the Spanish were taking Africans in, into the territory we call South Carolina in the Georgia, South Carolina territory in 1526. This is 93 years before 1619. So this is why, um, even though there's some good information in the 1619 project and Nicole Hannah Jones headed that up, the 1619 project from the New York Times, there's, there's really some historical flaws and there's too much emphasis on the year 1619 when we, when we should also be looking at prior to 1619 as well. Okay, so on August 20th, 1619, 20 and odd Angolans, 20 and odd Africans, uh, kidnapped by the Portuguese, 
arrive in the British colony of Virginia and are then bought by English colonists. Okay, now they come in on the White Lion pirate ship. These, these were English pirate ships that, they're, that are going to capture these Africans. They hijack the Portuguese pirate. They, they hijack the Portuguese slave ship, which was uh, named the San Juan Batista. They hijack this Portuguese uh, slave ship and take these Africans into uh, Point Comfort in what is Hampton, Virginia. It wasn't Jamestown, it was Hampton, Virginia. All right, now, the arrival of the enslaved Africans in the New World marks a beginning of two and a half centuries of slavery in North America, two and a half centuries of slavery in North America. Founded at Jamestown in 1607, the Virginia colony was home to about 700 people by 1619, home to about 700 people by 1619, okay? Uh, now, let me do my disclaimer here because some of this information I'm gonna share with you, you probably have not heard before. Um, so I may say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness, just because you never heard them before, disagree with them or don't like them, does not mean that they are not true it just means you have to do some research to understand what it is I'm talking about, okay? Uh, because one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that uh, in 1619, uh, you did not have codified slave laws in any of the 13 uh, British colonies, okay? In 1619, you did not have codified slave laws in any of the, uh, what would be, what are going to become the 13 British colonies. Okay, you have indigenous servitude, but you don't have uh, codified slave laws. The first uh, colony to have codified slave laws is going to be um, Maryland in uh, 1641, right about 1641. It's going to be the colony of Maryland. Okay, so this whole thing, what, one of the things that's really important to understand I know people like to say, talk about, oh, you know, it's been racism since we first got here. We were enslaved since we first got here, all this stuff since we first got here, things like this. One, we didn't first get here in 1619, number one, in this land we call the United States of America, or what was also called Turtle Island, T-U-R-T-L-E, what was also called Turtle Island. We didn't first come here in 1619, number one. Number two, codified slave laws did not exist. Three, Slavery evolves in these 13 British colonies over time. They didn't, it, it didn't exist when these 29 Africans first arrived. Slavery evolved over time. Okay. These colonies really weren't designed, they really weren't founded to have slavery because if they were founded to have slavery, they would have had it prior to this because they already were dealing with slavery um, in, um, uh, in England. OK, they already were involved in the transatlantic slave trade in England going back to 1562 and Sir John Hawkins. So if they wanted to have it in the 13 British colonies, they would have already had it. All right. So uh, the first enslaved Africans to arrive in Virginia disembarked at Point Comfort, disembarked at Point Comfort in what today in what is today known as Fort Monroe, Fort Monroe at Point Comfort. Back at this time in 1619, it was actually Hampton, Virginia, not Jamestown, Virginia. Most of their names, as well as the exact number who remained at Point Comfort, have been lost to history. But much is known about their journey. Much is known about their journey. OK, and I want to pull up. Uh, I want to see if I could pull up a. I want to pull up some information from before the Mayflower as well. Um, where is that? Okay. We'll pull that up also. I want to pull up an excerpt from uh, before the Mayflower also. Okay. It's uh, page 40 from before the Mayflower. I want to pull up as well. All right. Let's continue here. Okay. We'll come to that in just a minute. Now, they were originally kidnapped by Portuguese colonial forces who, were, who sent captured members of the native Congo 
and Ndongo kingdoms on a forced march to the port of Luanda. A forced march to the port of Luanda. Okay, so they're captured by the uh, Portuguese and they're forced to march hundreds of miles to uh, the, the port of Luanda, the capital of modern day Angola. From there, they were ordered on the ship called the San Juan Batista, which set sail for Veracruz. Uh, they were going to uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, they were actually going to uh, be at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so they set sail for Veracruz in the in the colony of New Spain because this was uh, this would have been Spanish territory. Now, as quite common, about 150 of the 350 captives aboard the ship died during the crossing. Then, as it approached its destination, the ship was attacked by two privateer ships, the White Line and the Treasure. So these were two English pirate ships, the White Line and the Treasure. Okay. And the White Line and the Treasurer are going to hijack uh, the San Juan Batista, which was a Portuguese slave ship. And they're going to kidnap uh, uh, about 60 of these Africans and put them on two English pirate ships called the White Lion and the Treasurer. Now, it was the, it, it was the White Lion pirate ship which docked at Virginia Colony's Point Comfort. So if you go to Virginia, if you read about it, you read about Point Comfort in Virginia. And that and, and at the time that was in Hampton, Virginia. OK. And they traded some of the prisoners for for food, food, water, supplies, things like this on August 20th, 1619, August 20th, 1619. At this time, codified slave laws don't exist in any of the 13 colonies. OK, it's important for people to to understand this because the the way the history actually evolves the way the history actually happens is different than we think the history actually happens okay uh for instance if we look at this right here this is from uh page 40 uh before the mayflower by larone bennett jr and then if you take my online history classes we have a new class starting up uh uh thursday september 8th okay 2022 7 p.m eastern standard time ancient kemet the moors and the maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school we break down a lot of this information go deep into it okay so we'll give you the information so you can register for the class uh if we look at this here and i don't know how well you can see this but uh this is from page 40 of before the mayflower by larone bennett jr he says of all let's see we can bring this up some of all the improbable aspects of this situation the oddest to modern blacks and whites is that white people did not seem to know that they were white white people did not seem to know that they were white I'm just trying to see if i can blow this up for you I thought I had to, let me, I want to check another source for this. I thought I had, uh, uh, I thought I had this in a PDF when I scanned it out to check. But what he's talking about here is this is chapter two of uh, Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. And what he's talking about is when these, uh, in the early 1600s, when Europe, when Europeans come to this land, OK. The term white in generally speaking was not used for Europeans. They were called Christians or called English or Englishmen. OK. And African people were not referred to as Negro or Negroes. They were referred to as Moors, Black or Moors, Nagers and Nagars in the early 1600s in uh, these British colonies. OK. So if we look at this here um let's see here okay he says that uh of all the improbable aspects of this situation the oddest to modern blacks and whites is that white people did not seem to know that they were white it also appears from surviving evidence that the first white colonists had no concept of themselves as white 
the legal documents identified whites as Englishmen and or Christians, as Englishmen and or Christians. The word white with this burden of arrogance and biological pride developed late in the century, late in the 1600s or the 17th century as a direct result of slavery and the organized debasement of blacks as a direct result of slavery and the organized debasement of blacks. The same point can be made from the other side of the line. For a long time in colonial America, there was no legal name to focus white anxiety. For a long time in colonial America, there was no legal legal name to focus white anxiety. Um, the first blacks were called blackamoors, moors, negers, N-E-G-E-R-S, and negars, N-E-G-A-R-S. The word negro, negro, a Spanish and Portuguese term for black, did not come into general use in Virginia until the latter part of the century. Did not come into use in Virginia till the latter part of the century. So in 1619, when those Africans are coming in, when those Africans are being brought in, they weren't even calling them Negro. They're calling them Moors, Black or Moors. They may use the term African, but they weren't even calling them Negro, which is a Spanish and Portuguese term. All right. So it's important. It's important to understand this. Now, if we look here at um, let's go back to this article here, because I have a few different articles to show you. All right. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. Uh, all right. Let's see here. OK, let's go back to this one here from uh, history.com. All right. So scholars note that the arrivals were technically sold as indentured servants. Scholars note that the so they're talking about these 29 Africans from Angola were technically sold as indentured servants. And they were believed to be the Kumbundu uh, speaking uh, Africans of um, present day Angola. OK, would have been the kingdom of Ndongo, uh, N-D-O-N-G-O. Indentured servants agreed or in many cases were forced to work with no pay for a set amount of time, often to pay off a debt and could legally expect to become free at the end of the contract and could legally expect to become free at the end of the contract. Many Europeans who arrived in the Americas came as indentured servants. Okay, so they'll work for five to seven years. They'd be free. They're, they would be given tools, many cases land, sometimes money, different things like this. Okay, they would learn a skill. They'd become an apprentice, learn a skill during that five to seven years, something like that. Okay, despite this classification and records which indicate that some of them did eventually obtain their freedom did eventually obtain a freedom, it is clear that the Africans arriving at Point Comfort in 1619 were forced into servitude and that they fit the universal declaration of human rights definition of enslaved peoples. Even though chattel slavery didn't exist in 1619 in the 13 colonies, codified slave laws did not exist. This, this whole thing is going to evolve. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a lack of white indentured servants and they're going to turn to start enslaving Africans more. The arrival at Point Comfort marked a new chapter in the history of the transatlantic slave trade, which goes back. The transatlantic slave trade goes back to 1441 and Anton Gonzalez going into modern day Mauritania and capturing uh, 12 Africans and taking them back to Portugal. That, that's, that's the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. Now, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, it's, it's important to understand this. And, and we go through and, and break this down in uh, my online classes starting up uh, Thursday, September 8th. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. To understand the transatlantic slave trade beginning in the 1440s, you have to deal with hundreds of years of history of the Africans known as the Moors who are in Europe and conquer portions of Europe 
and they go in at 711 AD led by G General uh, Tariq Ibn Ziyad and they're going to conquer portions of uh, the Iberian Peninsula what today is known as Spain and Portugal okay and they go all throughout they go all throughout Europe and they're going to Africanize to various extents Europe they're also going to intermix into the European population and intermix into the European bloodline and change the complexion of a lot of Europeans as well okay so um the arrival at Point Comfort marked a new chapter in the history of the transatlantic slave trade which began in the early uh 1500s and continued into the mid 1800s okay so the the transatlantic slave trade goes back to the mid 1400s it didn't be it, it didn't start in the early 1500s now you'll see you will see some maps that start the transatlantic slave trade about 1518 and that deals with king charles v also no, known as king charles the first of spain signing the asiento de negro and the asiento de negro was a license that the spanish crown gave to um gave to slave trading uh nations and uh, gave to other nations and, and slave traders to provide um uh african slaves in these in the spanish colonies okay that's the asiento de negro so some sources that you look at dealing with the transatlantic slave trade they will start um when they it goes back to 1441 and the uh okay asiento de negros so if we look at this here dealing with uh from from britannica com um asiento de negros between the early 16th and and seventh in the early 16th and the mid 18th century okay this should show up here okay hold on let me refresh the screen just a second Okay, so when I change the screen, it should show up. Stand by. Asiento de Negros. Okay, so so the Asiento is going to be signed by King Charles V, of also known as King Charles I of uh, Spain, and is going to drastically uh increase the spread of the transatlantic slave trade okay this is going to be 1518 asiento de negros between the 16th and mid 18th century an agreement between the spanish crown private person or another sovereign power like another country by which the latter was granted a monopolizing african slaves for the spanish colonies in the americas so so and what the asiento does is uh, it's it's um they capture these africans and they take them directly to the destination as opposed to stopping in spain first and then going to their final destination so it speeds up the delivery of africans african captives it speeds up that delivery and it causes the transatlantic slave trade to really spread okay so how many people have never heard of the asiento de negros before now the contractor the uh, uh, Asentista, the contractor agreed pay a certain amount of money to the to the spanish crown for the monopoly and to deliver a stipulated number and to deliver and to deliver a stipulated number of male and female slaves for sale in the american markets the first such contractor was a genoese company that in 1517 agreed to uh agreed to supply 1000 african slaves over an eight-year period 
1,000 Africans over an eight year period. In 1528, an agreement was reached with a German firm to supply 4,000 Africans for its monopoly the German firm paid 20,000 ducats annually to the Spanish crown. Each African slave was sold at a price not exceeding 45 ducats. Until the 18th century, individual Spaniards, as well as subjects Portugal, France, and Great Britain entered into such contracts, these, 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 these asientos. In spite of heavy taxation, government interference, and unsettled trade conditions, all of which greatly curtailed uh, the profit profitability of asientos, foreigners nevertheless sought them because they provided the chance to share in the lucrative, in the lucrative Spanish American trade, and especially to acquire some of the gold and silver bullion produced by the slave trade and to acquire some of the gold and silver bullion produced by the you're talking about the african slave trade the last and most notable asiento was grant was 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 that granted to the british south sea company because these europeans are organizing themselves into slave trading companies the british the uh, royal company the dutch east india company uh different things like this they're organizing themselves into slave trading companies financed by uh the uh royalty financed by people with wealth and power oftentimes backed by banks oftentimes backed by european banks okay the last and most notable asiento was that granted by the british sea company in 1713 by a provision in the treaty of utrecht utrecht the contract entitled the company to send 4,800 African slaves to Spanish America annually for 30 years. Contracted them to send 4,800 African slaves to Spanish America, to the Spanish American colonies annually for 30 years and to send one ship each year to engage in general trade. OK, so check out the rest of this. OK, but this is the Asiento uh, when we go through one of the things we do in the class we go through when we look at this history chronologically and the asiento is something that drastically causes the transatlantic slave trade to spread okay it causes the the transatlantic slave trade to spread quickly increases the the need for um uh, for african slave labor okay uh so all, all all of this has a ripple effect all right let's go back i want to go back to this uh other piece here um from history.com okay i'm going to post the information here you can register for the new online uh class that we have uh that starts up uh thursday uh september 8th ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school we get deep into this history i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips everything uh we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast also it's uh, at our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. Um, we also have a bundle pack. You get both classes for $130. Uh, that's uh, over. It's really about a $360 value because it's, it's going to get you get bonus lectures, bonus presentations from me also. Uh, when you register for this the second class that we teach is on uh tuesdays starting september 13th class number one starts up from the civil war to the civil rights movement of black power 1865 to 1968 okay so we have two new classes starting up with class number one uh in the month of september all right so we have the information uh right on the home page of our website the history network.com and here in the thread of the broadcast also and we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch them anytime so a year from now two years from now you can go back and watch uh the entire uh course and here's the link for the bundle pack so you get the bundle you get both classes for 130 dollars you can also use this information with your children i would say the content is pg-13 
okay and you can use it with your children it's very engaging it's very visual we have video clips everything okay so the arrival at point comfort marked a new chapter in the history of the transatlantic slave trade which began uh didn't begin in the early 1500s it goes back to uh 1441 it's important it's important for us to, to understand that and continued in the mid 1800s um brazil is looked at as the last country to abolish the transatlantic slave trade 1888 um uh cuba abolishes it in 1886 okay now the transatlantic slave trade uprooted roughly 12 million africans depositing 5 million in brazil most of them are taken into south america okay most of the africans taken out of africa don't come to the united states somewhere between 380,000 to about 1.4 1.5 million come to the u.s it may be there was new evidence that came out uh, a few years ago that showed maybe three or four million came here uh but over three million in the caribbean okay though the number of africans brought to mainland north america was relatively small roughly 400 400,000, their labor and their descendants was crucial to the economies of the british colonies and later the united states the 13 british colonies and what would later become the united states two of the africans who arrived aboard the white lion pirate ship antonio and isabella became servants of quote unquote servants of captain william tucker commander of point comfort now their sons uh their son who was known as william william was born in 1624 okay their son william is the first known african child to have been born in america from from uh emanating from that group that came in 1619 and afterwards he's the first known african child born in those 13 british colonies he was born in 1624 and under the law of the time he was born a free man under the law of the time he was born a free man because because chattel slavery did not exist at this time in 1619 okay so it, it, so you know you be you being a uh enslaved for perpetuity and your children being born in, into slavery things like this 1619 that doesn't exist so william's born a free man now in the coming decades um in in the coming decades however slavery became codified in the coming decades however slavery became codified which means written into law now uh servants of uh servants of african origin were oftentimes forced into continue working after the end of their contract so they were indentured servant okay they were oftentimes forced to stay in that status after their contract ended and in 1640 a virginia court sentenced uh uh a rebellious servant named john punch to a uh, lifetime uh slavery with fewer indentured servants arriving from england with fewer indentured servants arriving from england a racial caste system developed and african servants were increasingly held for life so africans who went into indentured servitude and there are going to be some cases of african people coming from england voluntarily entering into indentured servitude and then after they serve out their uh servitude they acquire land things like this you're going to have some cases of people of african descent who go on to acquire uh white indentured servants also and they may own african indentured servants and have white indentured servants as well if you read chapter two of them before the mayfly by Lerone bennett jr he breaks all this down in chapter two now in 1662 a, a, a virginia court ruled that children born to enslaved mothers were property of the mother's owner okay in 1662 a virginia court ruled that children born to enslaved mothers were the property of the mother's owner 
So they're formulating. We, we go through and we see how all these laws get formulate, formulated. Now, it's important to understand. Different colonies are going to have different laws and different and these laws evolve in different colonies at different times. So just because you have uh, uh, just because you have a law in the colony of Maryland does not mean it's the same. If, if they pass a law in the colony of Maryland. It doesn't mean that it gets passed in all the or or it applies to all the other colonies at the same time. Each individual colony has to pass their individual laws. So as um, cash crops like tobacco, cotton and sugar became pillars of the colonial economy, slavery became its engine as these cash crops the increase for demand of these cash crops and and keep in mind they're setting up these colonies they're generating all these cash crops also sending some of them to england so england can sell them as well and sell them to other countries also as cash crops like tobacco cotton and sugar became pillars of the colonial economy slavery became its engine Though the slave trade, the international transatlantic slave trade was outlawed in 1807, and we break this down in the class and, and, and deal with how uh, what that's based upon. That's based that goes back to the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 and them debating about outlawing the international transatlantic slave trade. And the international transatlantic slave trade deals with bringing Africans into the country to enslave them. That's the international transatlantic slave trade that's going to be outlawed by Congress, March 2nd, 1807, okay? March 2nd, 1807, the International Transatlantic Slave Trade is abolished, and that ties to Article 1, Section 9, um, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution, which helps to lay the legal foundation for uh, reparations. We don't understand the U.S. Constitution. We don't, a lot of our people don't read, so they just spout nonsense like, um, you know, we're supposed we're, uh, we're supposed to get reparations because our ancestors work for free. OK, well, when you study the, the laws at the time, it was legal not to pay them. It was legal to enslave them. You go back and you look at the Virginia slave codes of, of 1705. It was legal to slave them. They, they passed laws that made it legal to enslave them and not pay them. So why are you arguing reparations for what was done that was legal when we should be arguing reparations for what was done that was illegal and violated federal law because when the transatlantic slave trade was abolished 1807 the law goes into effect january 1st 1808 they kept bringing africans into this country violating federal law so all the africans that were brought into this country from january 1st 1808 through uh, about July of 1860, when the Clotilda comes into Alabama, which is the last known slave ship to come into this country. And when you study the Clotilda, um, th that when that ship came in, those Africans, they hid them in the swamp for a number of days because it was illegal for the ship to come into U.S. waters. OK, so instead of us. Instead of us arguing for when we deal with reparations and the, and the other arguments, the, the, the best thing to do is to deal with present day conditions and standard laws and policies uh, put in place to bring about the present day racial uh, uh, racial disparities, wealth gap, education gap, things like this. Deal with the laws and policies put in place that created those disparities and then trace that back to slavery and focus on changing the present day conditions. The, the deal with the laws and policies that are still in place that now distribute wealth power and resources okay as opposed to just the focus on chattel slavery which ended 157 years ago and all and all the last of the former slaves died in the 1950s we should we, we should be focusing on present day um inequity structural inequities deal with the laws and policies that created those structural inequities that bring us to where we are today and then trace that back to slavery as opposed to just keep talking about slavery you have to make the connection between slavery laws and policies 
that are still in existence today that continue to do us harm, that continue to inflict harm on us today. Um, read about the Clotilda. Last American slave ship is discovered in Alabama. The schooner Clotilda smuggled African captives into the U.S. in 1860, more than 50 years after importing slaves was outlawed, more than 50 years after importing slaves was outlawed. OK, this is from National Geographic, May 22nd, 2019. OK, and they talk about the, the, the Clotilda being discovered um, in Alabama. And they deal with the fact that when that ship came in, it was illegal uh, uh, for it to come into U.S. waters. OK, the captives who uh, arrived aboard Clotilda were the last of an estimated 389,000 Africans delivered to delivered into bondage in mainland America from the early 1600s to 1860. Um, OK, this is some of what they found when they discovered the ship. Marine archaeologists recovered nails, spikes, and bolts, B-O-L-T-S, used to secure the ship's beams and planking made of hand-forged iron. Such fasteners were common in schooners built in Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, in the mid-19th century. Uh, okay, so read this article here dealing with it. There's a lot more out, uh, a lot more articles also. We know that um, Zora Neale Hurston, the uh, great author Zora Neale Hurston, she was uh, an anthropologist also. She interviewed Kudjo Lewis. Kudjo Lewis, um, at the time in 1927, he was, the, he was uh, thought to be the last living survivor of those Africans on the Clotilda slave ships. Another one who was discovered afterwards, um, Radoshi, I think is her name, Radoshi. She was also on that ship and she outlived uh, Kudjo Lewis. But uh, Zora Neale Hurston interviewed Kudjo Lewis for, uh, it was her last manuscript. It went unpublished uh, it, it, uh, for decades. It was finally published in 2018. It was called Barracoon, Barracoon, okay? Her book, Barracoon, finally published in 2018, includes Kudjo Lewis's telling of the harrowing voyage aboard uh, the Clotilda. All right. And then the, and when you study the Clotilda, uh, the, the whole, the reason why those Africans were captured is because, and brought to this country, is because of a bet. This white man named Timothy Mayer, M-E-A-H-E-R, Timothy Mayer, he was a wealthy Mobile, Alabama landowner and shipbuilder, he allegedly wagered several northern businessmen a thousand dollars that he could smuggle a cargo of Africans into Mobile, Alabama under the nose of federal officials because it was illegal. OK, this is what I'm saying. Instead of arguing what was done that was legal. And making an argument for reparations, because you need to make sure you're making a legal argument. Because if the bill passes and gets signed in the law, when it gets challenged in court, you have to make sure that it, it, it does not violate the U.S. Constitution. Otherwise, it would get overturned in the federal courts, federal court, federal, federal district court, federal court of appeals, U.S. Supreme Court. And they and they and the courts rule that something is legal or illegal based upon its constitutionality whether it falls within the U.S. Constitution, so it's, de so it's determined as legal, or whether it's determined unconstitutional, like the uh, the Dobbs uh, lawsuit coming out of Mississippi that basically strikes down Roe versus Wade, okay, and leaves it up to the state. So it takes away the uh, constitutional protections for abortion when it comes to women, constitutional protection of abortions uh, that they've, had for 50 years it takes away that constitutional right leads it up to the states so the states can pass laws to abolish it all right so it is it, it's, it's something that's the, the, the that's determined unconstitutional it's not protected by the constitution or violates the constitution so you have to make sure your legal argument for reparations is based upon law and falls within the constitution OK, well, the reason why the transatlantic slave trade, the international transatlantic slave trade was abolished May 2nd, 1807, why that bill passed Congress May 2nd, 1807, 
it goes into 1st January 1st, 1808. Okay. And it becomes federal law. So here they're violated when the Clotilda comes in in 1860. It's illegal to bring Africans into this country. It's a violation of federal law. That court case is a white man who were caught bringing Africans into the country and they're prosecuted. And then one of the biggest, the, the biggest, one of the biggest cases is the, is the U.S. Supreme Court case of uh, the U.S. versus the Amistad, 1841. That's why those Africans were set free, Joseph St. Q and those other Africans on the Amistad slave ship, because when that ship came into the U.S., it was illegal for Africans to be to be brought to the to be enslaved. That's why they were set free. It, it also violated international treaties also because the U.S. entered into international treaties along with Great Britain in uh, uh, 1808. Great Britain entered into it in 1807. U.S. enters into those international treaties in 1808 to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade because there's a number of uh, European nations that entered into those European, that entered into those international treaties also. Okay, so he alleged, Timothy Mayer alleg allegedly wagered several northern businessmen a thousand dollars that he could smuggle a cargo of africans into mobile alabama under the nose of federal officials under the nose of federal officials importing africans uh importing african slaves into the united states had been illegal since 1808 once again when we make when we make legal arguments for reparations because if you're not making legal arguments i don't know what you're doing because if you're not making legal arguments, it'll get overturned. If, it, if, if somehow it does pass, it's going to be overturned in court. Okay. So when we make legal arguments for reparations, why are we arguing for reparations for what was done that was legal? Why wouldn't we argue for what was done that was illegal and violates federal law and overwhelming evidence in court cases to back up your legal argument? But you have to understand this history of law in the first place to be able to make these legal arguments. Importing African slaves into the United States had been illegal since 1808. And Southern plantation owners had seen prices in the domestic slave trade skyrocket. Many, including Timothy Mayer, were advocating for reopening the slave trade, okay, to drive down the prices. In 1860, Clotilda smuggled West African captives into the U.S. Uh, routes and dates are taken from the account of the ship's captain, William Foster. Okay, so they give a breakdown here. All right, so read the rest of this here. Okay, but these are some of the things that we um, deal with in the um, online history class starting up Saturday, uh, starting up Thursday. Uh, September 8th, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So we have the information here in the thread of the broadcast. Also, it's on the uh, homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, we get deep into this history. It's an eight-week online history class. We do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, and deal with thousands of years of history, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay, so the 1860 um, uh, the 1860 census found that there were more than 3,953,760 enslaved African people in the United States, making up roughly 13% of the total population. This is in 1860, all right? Okay, now, so that's just a little, that's a little background information there. Now, if we look at, this um if we look at this piece here uh there was one from there's one from usa today i want to pick up right quick there's a good article from usa today that did what's the name of that article 16 19 400 years ago 
this one right here. Hold on. Okay. So there's a good article from uh, USA Today that I want to go to. Close out these ads. All right. Uh, name of this article 1619, 400 years ago. In Virginia, bearing human cargo. Okay. 1619, 400 years ago. A ship arrived bearing human cargo. This is from uh, February 8th, 2019. February 8th, 2019. This article came out. And if we look at this here briefly, um, the part I want to go to. is okay they mentioned Lerone bennett jr here also they talk about the san juan batista the uh pirate ship there were 147 africans uh on board uh docked near what is now veracruz mexico okay they talk about Lerone bennett jr and before the mayflower as well When the White Lion uh, pirate ship arrived unheralded in Point Comfort, the captain's immediate task was to sell the Africans in exchange for food. There was a part in here. uh okay then they show this right here okay now this is an example here they talk about the transatlantic slave trade and they start in 1501 from about 1501 to 1875 africans seized by slave traders on the continent were taken to uh taken not only to the united states taken not only to the united states but also the South America and uh, the Caribbean major destinations. Okay, so they have this good map. We, we use this map in the class also. But they start in 1501, but the transatlantic slave trade begins in 1441. All right, now there's a part I wanted to look for here. Is it in this one? Okay, but this gives some uh, good background uh, history also. It concludes Um, it concludes with 1705. Where is it? Um, right here. By 1705, any ambiguity about the status of blacks free indentured enslaved was clarified by a series of so-called racial integrity laws that institutionalized white supremacy we see this uh in virginia 1705 the virginia slave codes okay so check out this article here uh there was a 
another one to, one to look at 1619 400 years ago a ship arrived in virginia bearing human cargo that's from uh, usa today so you can check that out now there's another good one here from um this is from virginiamercury.com virginiamercury.com uh, and before we go to that one, I want to go to this slide here. Let's see, current slide. Let's look at this here. This shows the historical marker. It shows the historical marker that's at uh, Point Comfort in Virginia. Okay, this historical marker says uh, the it, it this deals with the first Africans in Virginia. It says the first documented Africans in Virginia. And you know what? This is uh, actually in the article that I'm looking at. It'd probably be larger uh, if we show it to you. We could just show it to you in the article. Here we go. Let's look at it in the article. It'd be easier to see. Okay, first Africans in Virginia. The first documented um, Africans in Virginia arrived here in August 1619 on the White Lion, L-I-O-N, the White Lion, an English privateer based in the Netherlands, based in the Netherlands. Colonial officials traded food for these 20 and odd Africans who had been captured from a Portuguese slave ship. Among present day Hamptons, earliest African residents were Antony and Isabella. Their son, William, was the first um, was the first child of African ancestry known to have been born in Virginia, circa 1624 around 1624 many of the earliest africans were held as slaves but some individuals became free many of the earliest africans were held as slaves but some individuals became free a legal framework for hereditary lifelong slavery in virginia evolved during the 1600s the United States abolished slavery in 1865. So in Virginia, as well as the other colonies, once again, 1619 codified slave laws didn't exist. Chattel slavery didn't exist. You being enslaved for perpetuity didn't exist. Um, your children being born into slavery didn't exist. This is why William was born in 1624. When he was born, he was born free. That whole framework didn't exist in 1619, 1620, 1624. It's going to evolve over a period of time. So this is from the Department of Historic Resources, 2015. This is at Virginia. This is at Point Comfort in Virginia. Okay, so this is a really good article here. And I use this in my lectures, things like this. Uh, this piece here, much of what we've been told about Virginia's 1619 first Africans is wrong. Much of what we've been told about Virginia's 1619 first Africans is wrong. Now, this is from uh, August 11, 2019. So it was a few days before August 20th, uh, 2019, when we had that 400th year commemoration. Okay, uh, and this is by Rex Springston for um, uh, VirginiaMercury.com. So, They talk about, um, says you might have heard about the commemoration taking place later this month. Uh, they cite PBS NewsHour, what PBS NewsHour said August 1st, 2019, 400 years ago this month, the first African slaves arrived in North America 
on what uh, on a ship landing at the Jamestown colony in what is today Virginia. OK, uh, this is PBS NewsHour, August 1st, uh, 2019. Now, that 1619 event, and then now the BBC, July 31st, 2019, said that 1619 event, quote, the first documented arrival of enslaved Africans in an area that would go on to become part of the United States. That's how the BBC phrased it. Um, the trader in chief, Benedict Donald, Donald Trump, speaking July 30th, 2019, in Jamestown, Virginia, he said, quote, it was the beginning of a barbaric trade of human lives okay i'm i'm sure somebody wrote that for him because he doesn't talk like that uh well okay so it uh so the article goes on to say well well no historians say the barbaric institution of slavery uh, surely damaged millions of black lives or african lives but those first those first did not happen and the ship bearing those 16 19 african captives did not arrive at jamestown did not arrive at jamestown it was hampton virginia and the african arrivals and, and the african arrivals were slaves not indentured servants and so on okay now it's disputed because Co codified slave laws did not exist in 1619 so based upon the laws in virginia they weren't slaves they were put into indentured servitude i've looked at numerous sources on this by the way quote there's a good deal of misinformation that swirls around the first africans question and everything even vaguely relating to it said melvin patrick uh eli a college of William and Mary historian. Now, Virginia is drawing. Uh, okay, we skip over that. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, what happened? In late July or early August that year, historians say two English privateers, little more than private vessels, but operating, but operating with government sanction, okay, from the government of England, attacked an overcrowded Portuguese slave ship. Uh, en route to Veracruz, Mexico, the Veracruz in the Gulf of Mexico, and stole about 60 um, Af uh, enslaved Africans or African captives. About 350 captives from West Central Africa uh, had been crammed into the slavery. So they came from Angola, present day Angola. Now, in late August, one of the English ships, the White Lion, showed up at Point Comfort at the mouth of the James River in present day Hampton, Virginia, in present day Hampton, Virginia, not Jamestown, and sold perhaps 30 Africans uh, uh, desperately for desperately needed supplies. Was that the beginning of slavery in the New World? Was that the beginning of slavery in the New, new World? Okay. No, it was not for a number of reasons okay historians say the spanish had enslaved africans in present-day latin america for more than a century uh the beginning of slavery in what became the u.s was it that no the spanish took enslaved africans to a settlement in the present-day carolinas in the south carolina georgia area in 1526 1526 this is and we deal with this in the in the class in the online course okay the African slaves rebelled and the settlement failed. Okay. The African slaves rebelled and the settlement failed. Uh, and it's believed they went off to live with Native Americans. There's about a hundred of them. Okay. They're going to uh, overthrow their oppressors. Also, the Spanish took African slaves to St. Augustine, Florida, which, unlike the Jamestown County in Virginia, still thrives in uh they take them in in uh 1565 so that spanish colony in 1565 was a successful colony whereas the one in 1526 uh was not a successful colony okay and that was um that one in 1526 
politics. Okay, there's a good article from Washington Post deals with this. Um, we talked about that before. That colony uh, that was uh, discovered by uh, Lucas Vasquez de uh, Alon. There's a good article here. Let me see. Can we pull that one up? Yeah, this one right here from um, Washington Post. Before 1619, there was 1526. Before 1619, there was 1526. The mystery of the first enslaved Africans and what came the United States. Okay, Spanish explorers brought 100 African slaves to a doomed settlement to a doomed settlement in South Carolina or Georgia. Within weeks, the subjugated revolted, then vanished. So it's important to understand that um, the Spanish are the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The Portuguese are the first ones. And when the Spanish are conquering the African Moors and the Moors are surrendering and uh, you have uh, Boab deal the surrenders uh, January 2nd, 1492, their last stronghold, uh, Granada. Um, and they're expelling some of the Moors out of Spain. Others are being captured and put into slavery and sent into Spanish colonies, sent into Spanish colonies. Okay. So we see all this history comes together, but the Spanish are going to be here. Um, in the land we call the United States of America, the Spanish are going to be here before the British, okay? And before the British colonies are set up. By the early 1520s, near all the uh, indigenous people in the Spanish colony of Hispaniola were dead. So Hispaniola is, uh, a is an island nation that uh, Columbus conquers uh, on his four voyages. He conquers Hispaniola in 1492, all right? And it's going to be on the western third of the island of Hispaniola where St. Dominique is or what those Africans are going to call Haiti, where you have the Haitian Revolution of uh, 1791 to 1803, and they declare their independence January 1st, 1804. Um, the the French are going to take control of St. Dominique in 1697. Okay. They take control of um, the Western third of the Island of Hispaniola. They take control of that from the Spanish in 1697. Okay. All right. Um, let's continue here. All right, Colin. Okay. Thanks so much for registering for, uh the classes colin thanks so much people you can register for these online courses now we have bonus content you can start watching now this really helps to support the african history network this really helps to finance the research i don't have millionaires and billionaires that support us things like this so you know i was on a call with dave anderson who owns the empowerment who you know owned the empowerment radio network that was the when i used to do nasty syndicated radio he was the owner of that. Uh, he's going to be on my show uh, September 11th. We're going to do a show together, uh, the African History Network show. But uh, I talked today because I, I, I got to figure out, trying to figure out how to keep the African History Network afloat because uh, it costs a lot of money to do all this. OK, so when you register for these classes, that really helps. Um, and we have the bundle pack. You can register individually uh for them but we also have the bundle pack so you can uh get you get a, a cost break but if you want to register for both classes we have them already discounted uh eighty dollars uh the class is regularly 130 dollars on sale eighty dollars as soon as you register we have content that you can start watching right now after you watch this broadcast we have content you can start watching now i'm going to be adding more content over the next couple of days leading up to the class okay so you visit our website theafricanhistorynetwork.com uh ancient kemet the moors and the maafa eight-week online class there's going to be a ton of information that you learn it's going to transform how you see history uh you're never going to be the same after this you're going to learn so much about our people um 
And, you know, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, what you allow the people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. Uh, the classes don't sell $80, regularly $130. That's number one, starts September 8th. It's going to be 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, we do the sessions live. All the sessions will be archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. So even a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class. And then um, starting September 13th, Tuesday, September 13th, we have from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, we have bonus content in this class also. This class here, we're going to start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. And uh, I create now both of these classes, I created the content. I created the curriculum for them. I've been studying history 30 years. I've been uh, the host of the African History Network show for 12 years. I created the African History Network show. Um, which one is this? Okay, this is uh, this. So these are the binders. This is some of the information. This is just some of the information because I have other. Um, I got other articles and things like this. So I'm putting all this stuff back into the binder. Okay, I'm putting it back into the binder. But this is the uh, curriculum for ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, we got. Um, and this is broken up into eight, eight sections. And there's over, it's probably about 100 articles now that we deal with in the class. So it's going to be a ton of information that you're going to get. Some of these articles are articles from the class, okay? Uh, we deal with everything from ancient African civilizations like ancient Kemet, Nubia, Axum, uh, Zimbabwe, Great Zimbabwe. We deal with the Punic Wars. We deal with all that, a chronology of history, okay? But this second class here, now, uh, understand the transatlantic slave trade. I've been teaching that since 2017, on and off since 2017. This second class I created in um, late 2021. And the reason why I had to create this second class is because this period of history from 1865 through 1968 is a critical, critical period of history to understand how we got to where we are today, to understand the racism that we're experiencing today and the laws and policies put in place to bring us to where we are today, to understand where we need to go from here, okay? So I created the second class, I created the curriculum, and there's even more information in the um, uh, second class. It, this, it, it, the second class is like two binders of information. That's how deep we're gonna go into this history, okay? the second class and um so this is some of the stuff here it's like we're going to look at things like state constitutions especially during uh reconstruction era after reconstruction look at things like the um uh, election rise of 1874 in alabama this is straight from alabama.com okay you follow you follow alabama we're going to look at a lot of these uh riots that took place these, this political violence that that was inflicted upon african americans during the reconstruction era all this is related to what's going on right now okay we we'll look at things like like this article right here this came out from time magazine we're going to look at some recent articles that are tied to history that that connect the past directly to what's going on today so you're going to see how relevant this information is okay? and you're going to see that uh, uh, this is not ancient history well you know some of the stuff we could do with this ancient history but it's still relevant today but this right here dealing with the attack on voting rights and understanding reaching okay can i close this ad please because I pay, I have a subscription to Time Magazine, so they shouldn't be showing me this ad. Can I, what can I do? I'm trying to increase the size of this. No, I don't want to see more. Okay, this right here. A new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. 45 states are failing to teach uh, students about the period that shaped race relations after the civil war okay so they're talking about the reconstruction era now this is how important this is and i'm going to connect this to an article um 
and uh, we'll probably talk about it. Maybe this uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do a separate broadcast to deal with this article because this is connected to uh, things that I've talked about a number of times on the African History Network show. OK, well, if we look at this here from look at this article. Ad. Okay, hold on. Let me try to rest the screen. Okay, what this article does from Time Magazine, it connects the January 6, 2021 insurrection. It connects that the political violence that we saw in the January 6, 2021 insurrection. It connects that to the uh, reconstruction era. It connects that to the reconstruction era. Now, I'm trying to refresh the screen. Let's, let's open this up again. Okay, let's look at this here. Hold on, let's open this up. Okay. All right, new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students uh, the, the period of relations after the Civil War. Okay, if we look at this, this is from January 12th, 2022. So it was a, uh, a year and six days after the January 6, 2021 insurrection. It says in the aftermath, the at the U.S. Capitol, many leading historians drew parallels between the violence and the Reconstruction era. Many leading historians drew parallels between the violence and the Reconstruction era, 1865 to 1877, the Reconstruction era, the period of political revolution directly following the American Civil War. Now, quote, the events we saw reminded me very much of the Reconstruction era and the overthrow of Reconstruction. So those domestic terrorists that, that Donald Trump sent to the U.S. Capitol building, okay, and they're attacking police officers. They're yelling, hang Mike Pence, things like this. Historian Eric Foner, who's one of the top historians on the Reconstruction period, he's saying that the political violence that he saw on January 6, 2021, reminded him very much of the Reconstruction era and the overthrow of Reconstruction. He said, which was often accompanied or accomplished, I should say, by violent assaults on elected officials, by violent assaults on elected officials. The January 6, 2021 insurrection is directly related to the Civil War and the Reconstruction era and the political violence that brought an end to Reconstruction. And this has to do with a fear of the browning of america a fear that by the year 2043 white people will no longer be the majority population in this country now some white people fear that some white people don't fear that okay some white people don't fear that i'm not saying all of them fear that but this also deals with advancements african americans are making so we become targeted we get targeted by the backlash okay the the uh and, and what what trump did was leading up to the let me refresh the screen here leading up to the 2021 insurrection okay can you all hear me okay uh leading up to the 2021 insurrection his anime when it came to and recounting votes in certain cities okay because he wasn't they weren't they didn't ask to recount votes in, in cities or states that they won, generally speaking. Recounting votes 
in Detroit, Michigan, where I live. And I live about four minutes away from the TCF Center where they were counting votes. So I saw uh, when the police had Woodward Avenue, which is the main, they had Woodward Avenue blocked off because Trump supporters were out there and it was, it, it, and it was, it was, they were causing problems. They were outside of the TCF center. Some of them were trying to get into the TCF center to stop the count or see what's going on. Things like that. He targeted Detroit, Atlanta, Georgia, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And these are four cities that have high African-American populations. And he was saying they were cheating. He was calling for recounting of the votes and Atlanta it was in Fulton County. I think it was, they paid for a recount of the vote and there was some other pay for a recount of the vote, things like this. They, they wanted to recount in Arizona. Biden picked up votes in Arizona after the recount. Okay. He racialized this. He targeted, uh, uh, lady Ruby. He targeted Ru Ruby Freeman. And, and uh, her daughter, Shay, who were uh, poll workers, he targeted them in, in phone calls and in the call he had with uh, Governor Brad, uh, 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 Brad uh, uh, Raffensperger, uh, uh, Secretary of State Raffensperger of Georgia. He targeted them in those calls. Rudy Giuliani targeted them as well, said they were passing uh, a flash drive. Uh, 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 to one another, and it was a, a ginger mint that uh, they uh, passed to her mother. Okay, so they get terrorized, right? So Trump, this goes back to what we saw. Okay, let me let me let me refresh the screen just a second here. Okay, stand by just a second. Let me refresh the screen. All right, we're back. Okay, so can you all hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Okay, so uh, Eric Foner is the author. So Eric Foner said uh, the events we saw January 6, 2021 reminded me very much, reminded me very much of the Reconstruction era and the overthrow of Reconstruction, which was often accompanied or accomplished, um, I should say, by violent assaults on elected officials, by violent assaults on elected officials. Now, Eric, of the book Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revenue, 63 to 1877, he said this in the interview with the New Yorker magazine published a week later, a week after the January 6, 2021 insurrection. Now, scholars say studying the aftermath of the Civil War can help put in context many of the most seminal events in the U.S. in recent years, from the brutal murder of George Floyd by police in 2020, May 25th, 2020, to the voter suppression laws enacted after black voters played a big role in helping uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris be elected president and vice president in 2020. But despite the timeliness of the era in today's climate, many students in American schools will not get a full education on Reconstruction until they get to college many students in american schools will not get a full education on reconstruction until they get to college problem is many of them are not going to go to college so when when are they going to learn that history and what's important for people to understand is that who the policies that you support and who you vote for political office has a lot to do with your understanding of politics and your understanding of history. So if you have people that don't understand the
the history of reconstruction in this country and what happens after reconstruction which is the jim crow era in in in, in the era where you have a lot of these former confederate states rewriting their state constitutions passing uh uh, uh, uh writing in the law a uh, segregation law segregating public accommodations segregating public transportation imposing poll taxes literacy tests and felony disenfranchisement laws felony disenfranchisement laws okay all this is going to come after reconstruction so if they don't understand that history they won't understand what's going on today and you have to have laws and policies to put in place to address that history to address to, to reverse these policies that are in place to address those historical inequities this is why understanding history is so important okay so the the article goes on to say uh in social studies standards let me go back to this here in social studies standards 45 out of 50 states in the district of columbia discussion on reconstruction is partial or non-existent in 45 out of 50 states and the district of columbia according to historians who reviewed the period who reviewed how the period is discussed in k-12 through social study standards for public schools nationwide they found that in 45 out of 50 states and the district of columbia discussion of reconstruction is either partial or non-existent now, in the report produced by the education nonprofit organization, the Zen Education Project, the study's authors say they are concerned that American children will grow up to be informed about a critical period of history that helps explain why full racial equality remains unfulfilled today. So they'll be ignorant on how we got to where we are today and understanding why these laws and policies have to be changed. OK, so this is so what we get to see is how all this history comes together. OK, give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Once again, you can register uh, for these online uh, classes. We have them starting up Thursday, uh, September 8th. 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, and we have a bundle pack. You can register for the bundle pack as well. We have the information at our website, uh, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, right on the homepage, and we'll post a link here for the bundle as well. Also, if you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show, through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show paypal.me forward slash the ahn show the socials keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting pay some of the bills etc and when you do it through cash app we have the uh cash app information right on the home page of our website when you do it through uh when you go to our cash app it'll say michael and show my picture there okay uh because there's some fake african history network cash app accounts out there i'm still trying to get cash app to shut down okay so we have the information around the homepage of our website right here this is our official cash app account dollars a h n show h o s h o w when you go to it it says michael and shows my picture we have a link here there it takes you to the next page right Okay, right here. Okay. Dollar sign the A H N show S H O W. Because these other ones here are um fake African History Network Cash App accounts. And then there's still a money from us using our logo things like this. These right here. This one here is dollar sign the A H N S H O. This one here is dollar sign the A H N S. But then in their name, they put our tag, dollar sign, the A-H-N-S-H-O-W. That's a fake account. This one right here did the same thing and used our logo. This is a fake account. So it's about five of them I've identified that are fake. And they've been stealing money from us. Okay, so this is our only 
Cash App account. That's why I have the link here and takes you directly to it and it has the barcode. Okay. All right. This, this is this is the type of stuff I have to deal with. All the work I do, this is the type of stuff I have to deal with. All right. Um, okay, let's let's continue. So now this article right here. This deals with something that we talk about uh, a lot in the uh, second class uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 and 1968. Um, now, this came out. I want you to see how relevant and timely this is. This article came out August 26, 2022. August 26, 2022. OK, this is from the Guardian dot com. And there are a few other articles out about this. Uh, story as well mississippi's jim crow era felony voting law is constitutional federal court rules mississippi's jim crow era felony voting law is constitutional federal court rules law passed right here law passed in 1890 was tailored to exclude the Negro, but appeals court says tweaks in 20th century, quote, cleansed discriminatory taint, cleansed discriminatory taint, end quote. This goes back to the Mississippi State Convention of 1890, where they rewrote the Mississippi State Constitution to impose poll taxes and literacy tests and felony disenfranchisement to suppress the African-American vote, to suppress the African-American vote in a state where African-Americans were the majority of the population. Okay. And what Mississippi did in 1890 became the Mississippi plan. And it was caught by other Southern states. Okay. The why you needed a Voting Rights Act of 1965 to strike down these laws that these former Confederate states put in place to get around the 15th Amendment. The reason why you needed a Voting Rights Act of 1965 is because of what happened in Mississippi in 1890. It's directly related. And most of our people don't understand this history. Okay? So if we look at this here briefly, this is an article by Sam Levine uh, for TheGuardian.com. A Jim Crow era provision of the Mississippi State Constitution. It was Section 241 of the Mississippi State Constitution. It was designed to disenfranchise African American voters. Is uh, a, a Jim Crow era provision of the Mississippi Constitution designed to disenfranchise Black voters is constitutional. A federal appellate court ruled on Wednesday. Okay. So this was last week, Wednesday. That would have been uh, Wednesday, August 24th. The case deals with the provision of the Mississippi State Constitution, Section 241, that lays out specific crimes that cause its citizens to be permanently, to, to cause its citizens to permanently lose the right to vote this go this this deals with felony disenfranchisement and if you get convicted of a felony you can't vote we're going to see this first start basically right around 1870 when the 15th amendment is adopted and african-american men get the right to vote that's where we we're really going to see them start with felony disenfranchisement then we're going to see it written into state constitutions and this is designed to suppress the African-American vote. Mississippi officials initially adopted the provision at a constitutional convention in 1890. Choosing crimes such as theft, arson, embezzlement, and bigamy that they believed African-Americans were more likely to commit. This is another strategy to get around the 15th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution that guaranteed the right to vote to African-American men. Because women are not, don't get the right to vote until 
the 19th Amendment of 1920. Quote, we came here to exclude the Negro. We are to exclude the Negro, said the convention's president. Nothing short of this will answer. Now, the convention's president, his name was Solomon Saladin Calhoun, and he was a white county judge. We're going to come to that in just a minute here. A majority of judges on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit did not dispute that the original provision was racist and unconstitutional. But they said Mississippi had since cleansed the provision of its discriminatory taint. They said Mississippi has since cleansed the provision of its discriminatory taint by tweaking the provision twice in the 20th century, last century, the 1900s. Voters removed burglary from the list of disfranchising crimes in 1950 okay in 1950 and at, and they added murder and rape to the list in 1968. now if you've been convicted of a crime what does that have to do with your right to vote because if you work you still have to pay taxes Think about this. If you've been convicted of a crime and you served your death to society, you, you did your time in prison, you come out, you know, you come out, of the, you go through the halfway house, you, you're you off uh, probation, all that stuff. Right now, if you have a job. And, you know. You make over a certain amount of money each year, you have to pay federal taxes. So what what does you being an ex-felon have to do with you losing your right to vote you can't vote you got to pay taxes why can't you vote isn't that taxation without representation you have to pay taxes and can't vote quote plaintiffs fail to now this is um the um majority decision here on the on the court case from Mississippi, Mississippi, um, uh, this was um, majority of judges of the U.S. Court of Appeals, Fifth Circuit, right? Okay, quote: Plaintiffs failed to meet their burden of showing that the current version of Section Two Forty One of the Mississippi State Constitution was motivated by discriminatory intent in addition mississippi has conclusively shown that any taint associated with section 241 has been cured end quote now a majority of justices for the fifth circuit one of the most conservative uh in the one of the most conservative benches in the u.s they wrote this in an opinion this is the majority opinion now the challengers in the case have said they plan to appeal the ruling to the supreme court which is a 6-3 conservative supreme court we'll see what happens there uh roland martin also talked about this on his show uh it was monday he talked about this on the show monday uh monday August 29th. Now, the decision will allow Mississippi to continue to enforce an extremely harsh policy when it comes to voting rights. When it comes to voting rights for those with certain felony convictions, 10 percent of the state of Mississippi voting age, the state of Mississippi's voting age population the highest rate in the country cannot vote because of felony because of a felony conviction according to an estimate from the sentencing project which is the criminal justice nonprofit 10% of mississippi's voting age population cannot vote because they have a felony what does having a felony have to do with you voting 
because if you get a job, you're going to have to pay federal taxes and state taxes and city. So if you have to pay taxes, why can't you vote? Now, this includes 16% of the black voting age population. Okay, 16% of the African American voting age population in Mississippi cannot vote because they have a felony. Now, the vast majority of people disenfranchised in the state have completed their criminal sentence. And the way they have the law written is that it makes it it makes it so hard for you to get your voting rights back in Mississippi. OK, so read the rest of this. Uh, read the rest of this piece here. Now, this directly. Th this is directly related to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which did not give the right to vote to African-Americans. That's that's a misunderstanding of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It did not give the right to vote. What it did was it protected the right to vote. And it, it made illegal obstructions to the 15th Amendment, the poll taxes, the literacy tests, the uh, uh, property ownership requirement, all those things. It made all that illegal, okay, that, that these southern states were doing, these former Confederate states, it made all that illegal. It did not give African-Americans the right to vote. African-Americans could already vote. And when you look at those laws in um, those former Confederate states, their laws did not say African-Americans could not vote. They just had other obstacles in the way of you voting. The, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 made all that stuff illegal. And then it also put federal oversight on those on those uh, states and territories that had a history of putting obstacles in the way of African Americans voting. So if they wanted to make any changes to locations or polling places, they wanted to make any changes to um, um, how many weeks you can have early voting, uh, things like this, they had to get oversight from a federal judge. OK, they had to get oversight from a federal judge. So this is what the 1965 Voting Rights Act did. We look at this article here from history.com. And these are some of the things we look at in the in the second class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, because we go through and look at all this history chronologically to understand, better understand what's going on today to understand where we need to go from here, understand laws and policies, things like this, how they have impacted us so we understand what needs to take place, what we need to fight for. Okay, then right here is called This one right here is called when did African-Americans actually get the right to vote? Now, once again, no, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. Nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. OK, so it's important to understand that. Um. In, in okay, the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, we skip over some of this. Black Americans gained full rights citizenship. Okay, uh, Reconstruction, presidential Reconstruction, and Black Codes. Okay, there were Lincoln. Uh, radical Republicans in Congress were outraged, arguing that Black Codes were uh, went uh, went a long way toward establishing slavery in all but name. Early in 1866, Congress passed the Civil Rights Bill. So there was a civil, as I explained uh, to people, and especially in, in the courses, civil rights did not start in 1955 with the Montgomery bus boycott or 1964. 
with the Civil Rights Act of 64. Civil Rights goes back to 1865 and 1866. You have the Civil Rights Act or the Civil Rights Bill of 1866, which laid the foundation for the 14th Amendment of 1868. Okay. Okay, so early in 1866, Congress passed the Civil Rights Bill, which aimed to build on the 13th Amendment and give black Americans uh, the rights of citizens. When uh, President Andrew Johnson vetoed the bill on the basis of opposing federal action on behalf of formerly enslaved people, because he was from the South, he was from Tennessee, he was sympathetic to the former slave owners. He was actually a Democrat who the Republicans got to run on the ticket with uh, Lincoln in 1860, okay, uh, for president. Uh, Congress overrode his veto, mark, marking the first time. What is this here? Hold on. Let me close this out. Okay. Congress um, overrode his veto, marking the first time in the nation's history that a major legislation became law over a presidential veto. Okay, so they deal with the 14th or 15th Amendments, 14th Amendment, 1868, 15th Amendment of um, uh, 1870. Um, okay, which granted uh, 15th Amendment, 1870 was which stated that voting rights could not be denied or abridged by uh, the United States on the basis of color by the United States on the base uh, or by any state on account of race color or previous condition of servitude this is only there are only two sections to the 15th amendment now reconstruction saw biracial democracy exist in the south for the first time though much of the power in state governments remained in white hands like african-american voters african-american elected officials faced the constant threat of intimidation and violence often at the hands of the ku klux klan or white supremacist groups like the like the white league or the night to the white camellia things like this okay um disenfranchised including okay so while the 15th amendment barred voting rights discrimination on the base of race it left the door open for states to determine the specific qualifications for suffrage okay so so uh states have a lot of control over who votes and that goes to the 10th amendment of the u.s constitution okay which deals with states rights now southern state legislatures used such qualifications including literacy tests poll taxes and other uh discriminatory practices to disenfranchise a majority of black voters in the decades following reconstruction as a result white dominated state legislatures consolidated control and effectively reestablished black codes in the form of so-called jim crow laws a system of segregation that would remain in place for nearly a century okay about the civil rights act of 64 which um once again strikes down um Plessy versus ferguson 1896 but on a broader basis dealing with public accommodations also it banned uh discriminating when it came to employment as well based upon race or ethnicity this 1964 civil rights act that, that a lot of people think that just had to do with public accommodations and and sitting at uh, and sitting at a uh, white lunch counters no it didn't it also dealt with economics as well and the 1964 civil rights act also created the uh equal employment opportunity commission the eeoc where we could file complaints uh and take action against uh discrimination when it came to uh discrimination like like on the job things like this or if we felt we would be we were being discriminated against when it came to employment okay now um continue challenges to black voting rights before the passage of the 1965 voting rights act an estimated 23 percent of eligible african-american voters were registered nationwide by 1969 that number rose to 61 percent okay 23 percent before the voting rights act 61 percent by 1969 by 1980 the percentage of adult black population 
on Southern voter rolls surpassed that in the rest of the country. The historian James C. Cobb wrote in 2015, adding that by the mid 1980s, there were more black people in public office in the South than in the rest of the nation combined. The 2012 turnout uh, of African-American voters exceeded that of white voters for the first time in history as 66.6% of eligible African-American voters turned out to help reelect President Barack Obama. This right here scared the hell out of a lot of white people. It scared the hell of a lot of right, white Republicans. The percentage of African-Americans who came out to vote in 2012, it was 66.6% of African-Americans who were registered to vote. That's the percentage that voted. That was the first presidential election where the percentage of African-Americans registered to vote surpassed the who actually voted surpassed the percentage of white people who were registered to vote that actually voted okay so what did so what did they do they came back and hit us in the courts they came back and hit us with the 2013 u.s supreme court case of shelby county versus holder which struck down section 5 of the voting rights act in 2013, the Supreme Court struck down a key provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, Voting Rights Act ruling in, in 5-4 in Shelby County versus Holder. Shelby County is in Alabama. Alabama was ground zero for the for the fight for the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The holder who was the defendant was Attorney General Eric Holder. They sued the Attorney General. ruling 5-4 in Shelby County versus Holder that it was unconstitutional to, once again, going back to the U.S. Constitution, that's why we need to read it and understand it. It was unconstitutional to require states with a history of voter discrimination to seek federal approval before changing their election laws because this is what the 1965 Voting Rights Act did. Section 5, this is what it did. If, if, if you wanted to make any changes to the location of polling places, or if you wanted to close down places, if you wanted to change the hours that uh, polling places are open, if you wanted to change how many Sundays the polls would be open for souls to the poll voting, where people, especially African Americans, go to vote after church, you had to get approval from a federal judge. There was federal oversight to protect the rights of African-Americans when it came to voting in states and territories that had a history of putting those obstacles in the way of us voting, okay? Shelby County versus Holder struck that down. When you go research this, within 24 hours, within 24 hours of that U.S. Supreme Court decision, states started passing voter suppression laws. These former Confederate states started passing voter suppression laws. They couldn't wait. They've been trying to strike down, they've been trying to weaken the Voting Rights Act for, for decades because they knew they were losing power. So, and they, and, and see Republicans understand better the power of the vote than many of us do. That's why they work so hard to suppress our vote. Now, in the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision, a number of states passed new restrictions on voting, including limiting early voting and requiring voters to show photo ID. This is within 24 hours of Shelby County versus Holder. They started passing these voter suppression laws, voter ID laws, things like this. Supporters argue such measures are designed to prevent voter fraud, which is almost non-existent widespread voter fraud doesn't exist widespread voter fraud doesn't exist your individual instances of it and that's that's rare that's minor a lot of that are just mistakes but even those rare even the deliberate uh voter fraud those are individuals committing deliberate voter fraud that's not anything significant. 
one is not going to change any of the election results two now while critics say like poll taxes and literacy tests before them disproportionately affect poor elderly african-american latino voters okay so check out read, read this article here when did african americans actually get the right to vote this is from history.com official website of the history channel all right now okay so how do you all like this type of information give us a thumbs up give us give us a like who still needs to register for these uh online history classes that we have starting up with class number one uh, class number one starts up saturday i mean sorry, not saturday, thursday thursday september 8th 2022 7 p.m eastern standard time and uh that's going to be ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school and we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place this is an eight-week online course we do i do a powerpoint presentation video clips we have video clips articles we have over 50 articles um in the class it's probably close there's over 50 yards probably about 70 articles now something like that uh the class is on sale 80 dollars regularly 130 dollars and you can pay a debit card credit card if you want to do cash app or something like that email us email us through the website uh and uh let us know the website is uh, the african history network.com the african history network.com you can also email us at uh, the ahn show at gmail.com okay so we do the sessions live all the archived and recorded you can go back and watch it anytime the second class we have starting up uh tuesday september 13th 7 p.m to 9 p.m from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 as soon as you register there's archive content that you can start watching now you can watch from around the world as soon as you register this archive content you can start watching now um we have a bundle pack you can register for both classes only 130 dollars click here for uh, the register here for the bundle pack we also have the we posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast if you've taken any of my online classes in the past uh email me um at um you can email me through the website or ahn show at the african history network.com but you can email me through the website you get a 50 percent discount if you take in any of my online classes in the past okay um so th those are for returning students we appreciate the returning students as well if you want to pay full price that's fine we definitely appreciate that as well <laughs> believe me but we'll, we'll, we'll give you a 50 percent discount uh for uh returning students also okay all right look hey we have to get out of here um uh, follow us on our facebook fan page the african history network the african history network and uh turn on live notifications so you know when we go live um you can also support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show we have the information around the home page of our website listen to the african history network show sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time on 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf and uh, we also broadcast on Facebook and YouTube when we're on live as well. We have audio podcasts of the shows also. You click right there on the home page, click on listen to podcasts. We have audio podcasts there um, uh, as well. Okay. And here is the link for the uh, all course bundle pack as well. Okay, so you can go ahead and register for these classes you can use this information with your children also like i said the, the information uh content is i would say it's pg-13 i don't do a lot of cursing uh it's not overly graphic etc it's very engaging i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles uh video clips so some of the uh uh slides we that i show we actually use in the class it is like about 150 slides something like that in the first uh the first class okay all right look we have to get out of here remember at the african history network we focus on educating empowering and inspiring people of african descent throughout the diaspora and around the world right now it's correct wrong behavior is not over till we win we're kind of forever we'll talk to you next time peace